Hello and welcome back. I took a little break because I had my English IO and my TOK presentation, but I will start making videos again. We're doing business management 4.3, which is about sales forecasting. And as usual, I am just using the official IB books. I have no credentials. I am not a teacher. So first of all, you have to understand why we do this. We do this because we want to predict the future. So sales forecasting is the process of predicting what a firm's future sales will be using quantitative methods, and it impacts all the functions of a business. So the first one that we will talk about is management. So this can be in the finance sec sector or anything like that. So this would help us determine how to budget and also to see the expected profits that will be made, which will then also help with the planning. So for HR, which is human resources, you would need to predict the future to see what type of people you need and why you need them and when you need them. So this is called workforce planning. For finance, you can also check the cash flow. And for and for operations, you can use you have to predict the future to see how efficient are your company is being and so that you can increase efficiency. And for marketing, it can be used for to see the potential future sales and thus the potential future market and for market planning. So before we get into the calculations, I will go through the benefits and disadvantages of sale forecasting. So some of the advantages are that you can get a better cash flow. By taking into consideration the different fluctuations between seasons and stuff like that, your finance managers can get a better plan to improve your business's position. Now, you can increase efficiency by knowing the exact number of goods to produce um, and planning for the amount of stock required in the future. The better workforce planning means that accurate sales can help you determine which type of people you actually need and what staff is required. The last advantage is that it improves your marketing planning uh, because marketers will hopefully be able to adjust their marketing strategies accordingly uh, to try and increase their market share because they're able to see the future trends. Now, there are only two disadvantages listed in the book, at least, which is that it is very time consuming. It takes a long time to calculate and because of the seasonal variations and uh, stuff like that, it can be very complex. I mean, not that complex, don't worry. Um, it ignores qualitative external factors as well. Um, so in this case, you think of all the steeple, the political, the social, the economical, stuff like that. This, anything changing within your society could also affect your sales, of course, for the future. So therefore, it can't be 100% accurate. So as I mentioned before, sale forecasting was a process using quantitative methods. So the, these quantitative methods are the time series analysis. So the first thing is that there is a trend. This is a visible pattern noted after inputting the past sales data. So if you either see that your data has increased or decreased, um, oh, and by the way, all of these time series analyses are essentially the reason why the sales line is not a straight line. As you can see on many graphs, it's usually not completely slate, slate, what the hell am I saying? Completely straight. There is no correlation, like direct correlation. Um, but yes, then there's seasonal fluctuations. These are the changes in demand because of varying in the season. Um, so for example, if you have a business with skiing, obviously this would be more popular during winter. So it would be different during different seasons. Then there's the, I really can't pronounce this, but cyclical fluctuations. That's how I believe it's pronounced. I'm probably wrong. Um, 
So this has to do with the cycle in an economy. So essentially when there's a recession or a boom, this could change. And also there are periods during the year where you might have a really good phase and a really bad phase. Then random fluctuations are just, just random. They, they stand out from the trend. This could happen for any reason. Now it's time for the math. So we're going to go through the three-year moving average and the four-year moving average, like how to calculate them. Now for the moving average, this is basically just a way for you to indicate how the trend is currently going. Because your sales revenue may be all over the place. It may be super high one year, super low another. But overall, it may be increasing or decreasing. This, the moving averages will help you determine the trend more or like indicate it in a emphasize it in a better way or a more clear way. So I will attempt to explain this in a algebraic type way. I will not all I mean by that is I will not be using numbers. <laughs> I will be using letters to try and explain this. So essentially for the three year moving average, you take year one plus year two plus year three so the sales for year one, year two, year three, add them all up, divide them by three, and that's that. Then for, and essentially where you would put that in your graph is below year two. So essentially you take three values, and in the middle of those three year values, you would put the three-year moving average. So there's no three-year moving average for year one. Then for year three, to get the moving average for year three, you would take B plus C plus D and divide it by three and then put it in the space under year three. So because C was in the middle of your calculations, it was B plus C plus T plus D, then you would put it under the C. So it's the thing in the middle. Now for the four year, you take the first floor, four, so that would be A plus B plus C plus D. Then you take the next four, but obviously you're not doing all eight. Instead, you're taking B plus C plus D plus E. So you're moving it up by one. And then you divide that by eight because there are eight numbers that you just added. And that is your answer. And you put that under the third year. Okay? So then if you want to do the fourth year, you would do B plus C plus D plus E plus C plus D plus E plus F. Divide that by eight. And then you get the digit for for the fourth year. And then you continue like that, you follow that pattern on and on. If you need to, I would suggest going and not listening to what I'm saying, because I feel like I might be confusing, but instead look at what I was writing and just follow that pattern, because it just continues like that on and on. So when you plot these lines on a graph, so you would have the actual sales plus the four-year moving average and the three-year moving average, you can make lines of best fit. And you can use those lines of best fit to predict information or data that you don't have, like for the next year, for the following years coming. This is known as extrapolation. So you are finding extra data outside of the data you already have. As you can see here, the straight line is the data you already have, and then you can continue this line, like just follow the straight line, and that would be the data that you are extrapolating, essentially. So to make your predictions of the future even more accurate, you can add the variations into your calculation. So a variation is the difference between your actual sales and the trend values. So the cyclical variation, you find this by you can do this for both the three-year and the four-year moving average. So let's take the three-year moving average as an example. You would take the original sales for year two and then minus it for the, uh, the three-year moving average number for year two. And to find the total, you add up all of these variations for all of the years divided by the amount of variations that exist. So if you have eight years, you would have, you would add up all the variations and then divide it by six because there would be six values. Now, you have to add this to the 
extrapolation. So you extrapolated, that's not a word probably, but let's pretend, um, and then you add this to the extrapolation, even if it's negative, because it will make your prediction more accurate to real life. Um, whether that makes it less since it's a negative number or more if it's a positive number. Now seasonal variations, how you find this is by calculating the average seasonal variation in each quarter. So for example, uh, if take three quarters of a year and the variation for part for quarter one is A, for quarter two is X, and for quarter three is B, you would take all of those, add them together, and then divide it by three, and there you go, you would have your average seasonal variations, and then you can add that to your extrapolated number. The last thing you have to know about this chapter is how to plot your data. Now, your specific teacher might have a very specific way that he or she wants you to do that. My teacher specifically told us that the sales revenue has to be a straight line. Meanwhile, the three-year moving average has to be dashed and the four-year moving average has to be dotted. I am not really sure exactly if this is like how all IB schools do, but this is how my teacher told us to do it. So ask your teacher. So um, this also goes with the trend line that they, they have to match the way you drew the original line. So for example, for the sales is a straight line. So the trend line is a straight line. Meanwhile, for the four year moving average, it's dotted. So the trend line is dotted, so on and so forth. You also add this little squiggly line, um, as you can see, which will tell you if you have skipped. Like if you don't start from zero, you have to add that squiggly line to signify that you're not starting your scale from zero, which if you're working in the millions, it could be very useless to start your scale from zero. Um, it is also important to labor, label your graph, so have years and also have the dollar sign or Swedish crown or, you know, whatever the number is in. Um, it is also quite useful to add a line where you're predicting. Just So for example, if I'm predicting year 9, I would add a line by year 9 because it could make it very easy for me to tell where to look and where my trend lines should stop. That is pretty much all I'm going to say about the graph. I, again, ask your specific teacher. It could be very different for different um, schools. And I just also want to specify that I did the trend lines wrong in this example because I didn't do dotted lines for the dotted line and I didn't do dashed lines for the dashed line. So ignore that. That was it for this chapter. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, comment. Um, you can follow me at Johanna Frenert on Instagram if you want. And... Goodbye. Hopefully everything goes well.